The top stories tonight in Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte extends the state of calamity declaration all over the Philippines for one year. All cemeteries, memorial parks, and columbariums in the country will be closed on October 29 to November 4, 2020. The Interagency Task Force Against COVID-19 approves this measure through resolution number 72. Sa buong Pilipinas, isasara po lahat ng cemeteryo kasama na po mga columbarium from October 29 hanggang November 4. Malacanang tells the European Union Parliament to go ahead with their threat to remove the country's zero tariff export status. Meanwhile, the Philippine government stands firm that courts in the country are working and there is freedom of the press here. Europe, go ahead. At the time of pandemic, the whole world will pay tribute to you. The Dolomite sand at the Baywalk is not the cause of the fish kill in Baseco, Manila City, based on a water analysis. More Australians to return home due to the lifting of international travel caps. And a Gaza City boy sends out messages of peace and hope through his rap songs. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Friday, September 18, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am Mariela Toza. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. First in the news, President Rodrigo Duterte extends the state of calamity declaration all over the Philippines for one year due to coronavirus disease 2019 through Proclamation Number 1021. The declaration is effective September 16 when the President signed the proclamation which will last until September 12 next year unless lifted earlier or extended. Under the state of calamity declaration, the national government and the local governments can utilize appropriate funds, including the Quick Response Fund, to contain the spread of COVID-19. Meanwhile, all cemeteries, memorial parks and columbariums in the country will be closed on October 29 to November 4, 2020. Rosa Licos tells us why. To prevent millions of Filipinos to troop to cemeteries on November 1 and 2 amid the coronavirus pandemic, the government has formally approved the closure of all private and public cemeteries, memorial parks, and columbariums in the country for one week. This move is effective from October 29 to November 4, 2020. The Interagency Task Force Against COVID-19 approves this through Resolution No. 72. Sa buong Pilipinas, Isasara po lahat ng cemeteryo kasama na po mga columbarium from October 29 hanggang November 4. However, the government will allow entry to cemeteries on or before the closure dates, particularly September 17 to November 15, 2020. The number of visitors shall be limited to a maximum of 30% venue capacity. People should wear face masks and face shields and maintain social distancing. Children and senior citizens are allowed to visit private and public cemeteries, memorial parks, and columbariums on the allowed days. Hindi po mag apply ang age restrictions sa mga bisita sa mga nasabing lugar. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Philippine Ports Authority trialed a new ticketing system today, which the agency aims to use broadly before the year ends. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. 
As contactless transactions are becoming part of the new normal, the Philippine Ports Authority is looking into using an automated ticketing system at ports in order to prevent direct physical contact between passengers and ticket sellers. The PPA trialed the system earlier today. Through this kiosk, passengers will be able to buy tickets and reserve their seats without physically transacting with their ticket seller. All they have to do is input the necessary details, insert their payment using either cash or a credit card, and then the machine will print out and eject a ticket. The automated ticketing system is also seen to prevent illegal transactions of people who take advantage of passengers. The normal ticket for a vehicle, for uh, Roro, is only $1,500 when you pay pesos. Pag ikaw ay pumunta doon at wala kang ticket, hindi ka na makakakuha ng ticket kasi may bumili na o nawala ubusan na ng ticket. Merong nag-iikot doon, magbebenta, yung normally 1,500 or 2,000, bibenta na nila ngayon doon sa gustong sumakay ng 7,000 pesos. So yun ang gusto nating iwasan. The PPA is also mulling over coming up with an online system through which passengers could book tickets. They are targeting to implement the project within this year. The PPA also plans to conduct contact tracing in all the ports and facilities it operates come next week. Those subject to this contact tracing efforts have to download an application called Trace available for both Android and iOS users. Ang mangyayari dito, lahat ng mag lahat ng mag uh, sa scan ay marerehistro sa system at malalaman ng sistema na tayong lahat halimbawa nagrehistro tayo, malalaman ng sistema na tayo ay magkakasama dito sa lugar na to. Kung merong isa man sa atin na mare-report na nag-positive halimbawa sa COVID-19, yung sistema mag-generate yan doon sa email mo o doon sa text number mo. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Department of Education warns the public against individuals who ask for donations using Deped's name. Dante Amento tells us why. The Department of Education or DepEd does not allow any person or group to collect donations. This is despite its need for a larger budget due to the changes in the education system in the country. But DepEd warns the public not to transact with anyone using the department's name and the name of Secretary Leonor Briones to solicit donations. DepEd also denies information circulating on social media that it is giving gadgets such as laptop, tablets, and even pocket Wi-Fi for free to learners. DepEd stresses there are local governments which provide gadgets for those who have none, like the Manila City and the Quezon City local governments. Secretary Briones explains that those gadgets were distributed to students and teachers through its regional or division offices. Manila has expended already 1.2 billion pesos to provide uh, children from uh, K-12 to up to 12, uh, to grade 12, as well as to provide um, uh, laptops and computers for teachers. And other local governments are, are doing the same thing. The Department of Education asks the public to report messages, transactions, or individuals who ask for donations to their public assistance and center through cell phone numbers 0919-456-0027 and 0995-921-8461 or through its email address action at deped.gov.ph Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue We serve the people, we give glory to God Part of PhilHealth's proposed budget for next year will go to its consultation package. But a lawmaker says that the budget to implement this project must come from the health department instead. Ray Pelayo tells us why. During the budget briefing of the Department of Health with the House Committee on Appropriations, Marikina Representative Estela Kimbo noted that PhilHealth projects 245 billion pesos for payouts next year. That includes 68 billion pesos for consulta package. The program will share 500 pesos for every Filipino that will seek medical consultation in a public facility and 750 pesos in a private one. It also includes 12 laboratories and 20 kinds of medicines. The program is part of the universal health care law that aims to immediately address and treat Filipinos' diseases 
at an early stage. But the lawmaker argues that the budget for this project should come from the health department. So itong 68 billion na nakalaan for consultation ay yan po ay makakabawas po sa budget na pwedeng gamitin po para sa inpatient or hospitalization po, Mr. Secretary. Gaya po na sinabi ninyo, baka sa DOH na lang dapat ito. But sa kayo po kasi ang DOH, pinag-aaralan din po yung tinatawag natin population-based and individual-based uh, services. PhilHealth is also asking 71 billion pesos in its 2021 budget to cover Filipinos who do not have the capability to pay their insurance. It also notes that the pandemic has caused low collections, especially from the informal sector. Sa ngayon po, ang informal natin, nahihirapan po tayong maningil dahil usually po, uh, ito po mga self-paying ay nagbabayad lang pagka nangangailangan sila ng mga beneficyo ng PhilHealth. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that more than 3,000 new cases of coronavirus infection were reported today, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to over 279,000. The National Capital Region logged almost 1,000 additional cases, the most among regions and provinces with fresh cases, while Bulacan reported close to 300 new patients. Patients. Cavite, Negros Occidental, and Cebu all posted more than 100 new positive cases. We have lost 47 more patients. But through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 733 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 208,790. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of close to 30.2 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignty. The fast-spreading disease has claimed more than 946,000 lives, while over 20.5 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. Thanks be to God. There will be new protocols in the World Health Organization's solidarity trial in the Philippines that will use drug combinations and treatments. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, explains why. A new drug will be included in WHO solidarity trial being conducted in the Philippines, which use treatments and drug combinations. According to health spokesperson under Secretary Maria Rosario Vergere, the new protocols have yet to be finalized. Binago rin yung protocol, may bagong gamot po na idadagdag, uh, but we will be informing all of you kapag na-finalize na yung protocol. Pero mayroon pong arm ng isang gamot na idadagdag. For that, we can already share to our media party. Based on the DOH report, as of September 7, there are 1,009 severe COVID-19 patients in the country being treated under WHO's solidarity trial. Remdesivir, a drug for Ebola virus, is used in the trial. There are 24 study sites in the country's solidarity trial. These sites are located in the National Capital Region, Baguio City, Batangas, Cebu, and Davao. Meanwhile, although there is an international shortage of remdesivir supply, another batch of vials are arriving from WHO Geneva to the Philippines. This is good news for us because yun pong shipment ng remdesivir ay uh, parating na po, pati ang interferon no, no, sa proseso na sila. And this would be the third shipment of remdesivir to our country uh, where we are going to receive 1,000 vials coming from WHO. The Solidarity Trial started four months ago. It aims to test the efficacy of drug combinations and treatments for COVID-19 patients. Remdesivir is one of the four drugs used in the ongoing Solidarity Trial recommended by WHO. 
The use of hydroxychloroquine, a drug for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, and for malaria has been halted by WHO as it is believed to have adverse effects on patients with cardiovascular diseases. And even the administration of lopinavir or ritonavir, an anti-malarial drug, has also been halted for COVID-19 patients participating in the solidarity trial. WHO stated last July that both hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, ritonavir, produce little or no reduction in the mortality of hospitalized COVID-19 patients when compared with standard care. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Bataan province will not allow the entry of people from outside its borders who cannot present an authorized QR code. One of our correspondents in Luzon, Leslie Huidem, details why. Starting October 1, the no QR code, no entry policy will be implemented in Bataan. The QR code will be the entry pass of people who wish to enter the province to be presented to authorities in all entry points or checkpoints. The aim of this policy is to intensify and enhance contact tracing efforts and to fast track the process that returning overseas Filipinos, locally stranded individuals, and authorized persons outside of residence will undergo. According to Governor Albert Garcia, the new QR system is one way to stem the spread of the killer virus in the province. There is also an ongoing dry run to prepare volunteers and officers that will be assigned in the checkpoints such as the employees from Metro Manila Bataan Development Authority, PNP Bataan and Bureau of Fire Protection that is authorized to monitor the QR code system using the GetPass mobile application. Here's how to get the QR code. You may download the GetPass application that is available in Google Play and App Store and then sign up. Answer the declaration form. Press the calendar button and go to the travel authorization section and fill in the question pertaining to your travel appointments. Save or you may print the QR code that has the date of your arrival and appointment number. When you travel to Bataan, bring the printed QR code together with a valid ID and certificate of employment. Present these documents to be allowed entry to Bataan. The provincial government of Bataan asks for everyone's cooperation to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Leslie Widem, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The dolomite sand at the Baywalk is not the cause of the fish kill in Baseco, Manila City, based on a water analysis. To give the details why, Vincent Arboleda will join us tonight live. Yes, Vincent? Harleen accusations have been hurled at the White Sand Project of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DNR, as the cause of the fish kill in Baseco, Manila City. But... Results of the water quality analysis conducted by the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources showed otherwise. Based on BFAR's analysis, it was not dolomite, but the very low level of dissolved oxygen in the waters in Baseco caused the fish kill. Water samples were taken last September 16 from four different areas to know the cause of the incident. The results show that the waters in Baseco Beach area contains only 0.11 mg of dissolved oxygen per liter of water an amount that is very low to support marine life. According to BFAR, dissolved ox oxygen must be at least 5 mg per liter to be considered acceptable and to support marine life. Some groups have previously linked the White Sand Project at the Manila Bay with the fish kill. Meanwhile, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources is also looking into the possibility of a sabotage to put its beach nourishment project in bad light. DNR Undersecretary Benny Antiporta said they are also looking if there is a presence of cyanide in the area. In case may makita kami cyanide mamya doon sa content, ang pag-aaralan naman natin kung ito ba ay sa illegal fishing o intentional just to discredit the government on our project. Harleen, Yusek Antiporta has earlier said that the dolomite at the Baywalk area has nothing to do with the fish kill incident in Baseco as the two areas are far from each other. To add to that is the breakwater that separates both areas. Harleen? Uh, Vincent, there have been reports that some residents are cooking and eating these uh, dead fishes. Are they uh, safe for consumption? 
Harina according to BFAR, while consuming these fishes that died due to the depletion of dissolved oxygen is not entirely harmful, the Bureau, of, no, the Bureau still advises the public to refrain from consuming these dead fishes to avoid possible harm to human health. Uh, Vincent, taking this into account, are there recommendations from before on how to increase the level of dissolved oxygen in the area? Yes, Harleen Bifar advised to properly dispose of the dead fishes and cleaning of the affected area to improve water quality. Yusek Benny Atiporda also mentioned that the Basaka area will be included in the International Coastal Cleanup, which will be held tomorrow. Back to you, Harleen. Thank you so much, Vincent Arboleda, for that report. Meanwhile, the palace agrees that the internet speed in the country is not too bad compared with our neighboring countries. This comes after the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or DICT, Secretary Gregorio Honasan said in the budget hearing at the House of Representatives uh, that the country's internet speed of 3 to 7 megabits per second, or Mbps, is not that bad compared with the 55 Mbps in other countries. Uh, Secretary Gringo Onasan was absolutely correct. It's not bad compared to our neighbors. As in fact, it is better than what was stated by uh, Secretary Onasan. Sa panahon na talagang pati sa edukasyon, nangangailangan tayo ng internet, inaasahan po ng presidente na dahil ginawa naman niya ang kanyang uh, obligasyon na sabihan ng mga lokal ng pamahalaan dahil silang sinisisi ng telcos um, to shape up, eh, hindi na po tatanggap ng kahit anong alabay ang presidente in the future kung hindi po mapabuti ang ating uh, telecom sa bansa. However, some senators did not agree with this. For one, Senator Pan Filolakson says he respects the comments of former Senator Honasan but adds that the country's internet speed is not so bad to saying that the uh, speed of the of internet speed is not so bad may sound worse than saying that it is not so good. Senator Lakson notes that what the people want to hear is that it is good enough or even excellent, especially now that virtual communication is vital amid the pandemic. Meanwhile, Senate President Vicente Soto III believes that Secretary Hunasan was just being conservative with his statement. While for Senator Sonny Angara, decisive steps such as the National Broadband Program should be taken to improve the country's internet speed, reach, and affordability. In another news, a lawmaker is urging the Bureau of Customs or BOC to donate smuggled electronic gadgets to students in need for their lear online learning. According to Senator Aimee Marcus, who chairs the Senate Committee on Economic Affairs, the smuggled items confiscated by the Bureau, such as cell phones, laptops, and tablets, can be donated by the government 15 days after they remain unclaimed by their importers, instead of disposing them or auctioning them. The Senator adds, attempts to illegally import electronic devices are likely to increase Increase due to a high demand amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Marcus also noted that the BOC confiscated almost 30 tons of cell phones and other electronic devices that lack clearance from the Bureau of Product Standards, the National Telecommunications Commission, and the Optical Media Board last August. Malacanang tells the European Union Parliament to go ahead with their threat to remove the zero-tariff export status of the Philippines. Our Malacanang correspondent Rosa Licoz explains why. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque is not frightened by the Parliament's move to suggest the removal of the Philippines' exports tariff exemption in the EU due to alleged serious human rights violations in the country. Malacanang challenges the European Union or EU Parliament to do what they say against the Philippines. The Philippine government stands firm that courts in the country are working and there is freedom of the press here. Europe, go ahead. At the time of pandemic, the whole world will pay tribute to you. 
Under the Generalized Scheme of Preference Plus, developing countries have the privilege of exporting zero-duty merchandise to EU member states in which some Philippine exports to Europe are benefiting from tariff breaks. In a resolution passed September 17, the European Union's Legislative Assembly urges the European Commission to start the procedure of temporarily removing the GSP Plus preference of the Philippines because there is no improvement in the human rights situation in the country. Kung gusto pang magdagdag ng pahirap ng mga Europeans at ikaliligaya nila, go ahead. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Drivers and operators of public utility vehicles are looking forward to the implementation of Bayanihan 2 law. The Department of Transportation, meanwhile, emphasizes the need for PUJ drivers to register as employees of respective operators. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. The Department of Transportation continues to finalize the actual implementation of Bayanihan 2 law, which allocates 9.5 billion pesos to address concerns in the transport sector. Most of the fund is designated to aid the drivers and operators of public utility vehicles severely affected by the community quarantine restrictions brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Pasang Basta President Roberto K. Obet Martin expresses gratitude for the government's aid. The transport group has been appealing for this as both drivers and operators only earn about 200 pesos a day due to the limited capacity. Tinanggap na namin ang damtong sitwasyon, tinanggap na rin namin, eto lang sa new normal ang aming kikitain, kanya yung ayuda na manggagaling ngayon sa ating pamahalaan ay napakalaking tulong po sa amin yan, sa operator at driver. According to the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board, 2.6 billion pesos is allocated to assist critically impacted businesses in the transportation industry in the form of cash or fuel subsidy, while 5.58 billion pesos is allotted to the service contracting program which provides subsidy to drivers affected by the limited capacity allowed among public utility vehicles. Uh, dun po sa mga sa mga drivers po ang uh, nakalagay po doon sa batas ay uh, service contracting ito po yung gina inaayos na po ng uh, BOTR at LTFR because saan po uh, magkakaroon po ng service contract ang uh, uh, LTFR with BOTR with the drivers or the operators doon po sa mga modern at sa buses para po uh, maibigay po yung mga yung a certain amount based doon sa mga KPIs po na yung key performance indicator para po uh, mabayaran po yung ating mga drivers during operation uh, habang po nagmamanayaw sila. The DOTR, however, reiterates to public utility jeepney operators to register the drivers of their units as employees to fully avail of corresponding benefits. Ang karamihan sa mga jeepney drivers, hindi nire-recognize ng operator as their employees. Yung boundary system uh, umiiral. So, unang-una, pag boundary system, malamang na hindi nagbabayad ng SSS. You know? Tapos, uh, yung, yung operator, wala yan sa kanyang kaisipan na siya ay naghahanap po ay dapat nakarehistor din siya sa dole. The transport group, on the other hand, encourages PUJ drivers and operators to adhere to the government's policy. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. The southwest monsoon or hanging habagat is affecting parts of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says this will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Mimaropa and Batangas. Meanwhile, ready your umbrellas because partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers will be experienced over Metro Manila and the rest of the country due to localized thunderstorms. Take extra precautions because possible flash floods or landslides may occur during severe thunderstorms. No tropical cyclone advisory is issued. 
The crime incidents in the country went down by almost half in the first six months of community quarantine periods. That means less than 100 crime incidents per day. Now the Joint Task Force COVID Shield is analyzing the crime situation in those six months. Our police correspondent Leia Ilagan reports why. The Philippine National Police recorded a 47% reduction in eight focus crimes during the six months of implementation of community quarantine in the country, particularly from March 16 until September 15, 2020. The reduction is comparable with the six months before the community quarantine period. The Joint Task Force COVID Shield reported that the crime incidents from March 17 to September 16 this year were a bit close to 17,000 compared with the more than 31,000 accounted from September 2019 until March 16, 2020. Lieutenant General Guillermo Eleazar explains the decline in the criminal incidents in the country translate to an average of 92 cases per day during six months of community quarantine compared with an average of 172 cases per day over the six months before the community quarantine period. Robbery incidents also declined to 61%, while incidences of theft went down to 60%. These are from the speculations that there will be an upsurge of crimes against property and looting due to economic difficulties. Eliasar adds they are conducting analysis of the crime situation in the past six months in order to identify the best practices and security adjustments to sustain the downtrend of crime incidents. Eliasar further says that PNP Chief Police General Camilo Cascolan has ordered to continue police visibility, beat patrols, and the coordination with the barangay officials to maintain peace and order. The eight focus crimes include murder, homicide, physical injury, rape, robbery, theft, carnapping of motorcycles, and carnapping of four-wheel vehicles. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Here in Australia, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced in today's National Cabinet meeting that New South Wales, Queensland and Western Australia have agreed to lift international arrival caps. New South Wales, Queensland and WA will soon be accepting 500 additional return travellers a week. Therefore, 1,500 strand or stranded Australians from overseas can return home every week. According to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the lifting of cap arrivals will be done in a staged way in consultation of the state governments. There are currently 24,000 stranded Australians overseas who wish to come back to Australia and 4,000 of them are considered vulnerable by the Department of Home Affairs or DFAT. New South Wales will be able to take an extra 500 return travellers per week starting the 28th of September and WA and Queensland have also agreed to take 200 per week on that same day, the Prime Minister said. Starting the 5th of October, Queensland will take an additional 300 um, making a total of 500 a week and WA will also move their cap to 500 more than at present by the 12th of October. New South Wales still carries the majority share with 3,000 a week and will continue to do that. When asked about allowing Australians to fly out of the country to avoid airlines flying with empty planes to collect returning Australians, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said that thousands of exemptions are made every week for this matter. Moreover, when asked regarding the federal government providing financial support for a faster hotel quarantine setup, the PM said that no states have asked for the federal government to pay for it. He also added that the federal government's contribution is the provision of the Australian Defence Force personnel and that travellers who are returning to Australia are paying for the quarantine themselves. 
and uh, next Friday, September 25 at 1 a.m., Queensland borders will be open to the Australian Capital Territory or ACT. According to Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaje, she has spoken with Chief Minister Andrew Barr to confirm that the ACT will be removed as a hotspot. She adds that they will be joining efforts with ACT authorities to ascertain that appropriate checks are in place at Canberra Airport for people flying into Queensland. However, anyone who has been in a declared hotspot in the past 14 days will not be allowed into Queensland. Premier Palage says this move is another step towards ensuring the state's economy rebounds and not the virus. In this time of pandemic, one of the greatest concerns is access to food, what with lockdowns and store closures. According to the state government, no New Yorkers should go to bed hungry. New Yorkers are reminded they can visit the website ny.gov slash food banks. More than one food pantries can be found in every county. That's ny.gov slash food banks. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases in countries worst hit by the pandemic. The United States of America's COVID-19 cases continue to surge, now with more than 6.67 million, including over 2.5 million recoveries. It also has the highest death toll as of today, with close to 100, 198,000. India continues to trail the USA with over 5.2 million confirmed cases and Brazil, the country with the third most caseload, has more than 4.45 million cases as of today. Meanwhile, a senior Iranian health official has declared a coronavirus red alert covering the entire country as daily deaths and cases increase at an alarming rate. Iran is one of the Middle Eastern countries hardest hit by the pandemic. The country has been divided up into white, orange or yellow and red regions based on the number of infections and deaths. The death toll rose by 144 to almost 24,000 today. Meteorologists warn that climate change could amplify record wildfires and hurricanes in the United States of America. One of our correspondents in the U.S., Sonny Cos, will tell us why. U.S. meteorologists say that climate change worsened both wildfires in West Coast USA and hurricanes in the East. Penn State University meteorologists argue that heating and drying out in the western U.S. and warming of the tropical Atlantic Ocean amplifies both phenomena. This year, the phenomena called La Nina were in natural cycle marked by cooler than average ocean water in the Central Pacific Ocean, the main weather drivers in the U.S. and around the world, especially in the late fall or early spring, was forecast to start last week. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA says that La Nina is expected to exacerbate both the wildfires and hurricanes this season. In the West U.S., the raging fires have burned a record of more than 5 million acres already. In the East, on the other hand, Hurricane Sally has brought record floods like the 5.6 feet peak storm tide seen in Pensacola, Florida, the third highest on record in the sea. Scientists have also seen tropical storms and hurricanes slow down once they hit land by about 17%, which allows them to unload more rain in one place. Sonicos, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And he's done it again. Our very own top pole vaulter Ernest John E.J. Obiena has won another honor for the Philippine flag. E.J. has just clinched his third bronze and sixth medal of the season against the top pole vaulters in the world at the Diamond League Rome 2020 early on Friday. 
The 24-year-old Filipino athlete tied with Ben Broders in the 5.80 meter clearance, but the Belgian clinched the silver, needing just two attempts to complete that height. EJ had to jump a third attempt to tally his new season's best. His world ranking remains at number 16 in men's pole vault. Congratulations, EJ Obiena. Astronomers discover a giant planet cir circling a tiny dying star. They say it's the first known celestial system of its kind. Jovic Bermas details why. Using the data from NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite or TESS, in collaboration with two large ground-based telescopes in the Canary Islands, an international team of astronomers surprisingly discovered a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting a distant white dwarf that is only 40% bigger than planet Earth. The strange orbital system, which astronomers thought may be the first of its kind, is about 80 light years away, deviating from the common conventions about stars and planets. After eventually exhausting its own nuclear fuel, the white dwarf that used to be a sun-like star 6 billion years ago lost 80% of its mass and greatly shrunken to approximately the size of Earth, while it retains half the sun's mass. The giant planet called WD1856b, estimated to have a mass 14 times that of Jupiter, circles the white dwarf at a pace of every 34 hours, 60 times faster than Mercury orbits our Sun. The astronomers suggest several scenarios that could have pushed WD1856b onto an elliptical path close to the white dwarf. They estimated that this massive planet possibly originated at least 50 times farther away from its current distance. Andrew Vanderberg, lead researcher and assistant professor from the University of Wisconsin Astronomy Department, said they have never seen evidence before of a planet coming so close to a white dwarf and surviving. The astronomers presume that a planet so close to a dying star that still releases light and no longer conduct nuclear fusion may find itself in the habitable zone, where liquid water can exist and support life. This unique structure of white dwarf planet system, published in the journal Nature, is the clearest evidence yet that this bizarre pairing of a giant planet orbiting a white dwarf exists, an ideal opportunity for scientists to study the chemical signatures of orbiting planets' atmospheres in search for signs of life from a great distance. Jovic Bermas, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. An 11-year-old boy in Gaza City, Palestine, is slowly becoming popular on social media for his message of peace and hope through his rap music. Nina Armilio tells us why. Abdel Rahman Al Shanti, a student in the Palestinian city of Gaza, rhymes and raps his way to becoming heard all over the world. Abdel's talent in singing rap has been discovered by his friends and collaborators, and not in his mother tongue, but in English. I do it for my family, I do it for my soul, some people from the latter family, playing stories I'm told. My life is in the book, some of the pages with a book, the same as the world, and only God knows. Abdel says that his goal is to show how life is in Gaza City. He further says, he also wants to show how children like him are supposed to be just like any other children. Wake up in the morning and I ask myself, is life worth living? Should I bless myself? The schoolboy rapper writes his own lyrics and sing covers too. I am a little bit of loneliness, I'm a little bit of disregard. Half of the place, but I can't help the fact that everybody can see these scars. He started singing rap two years ago, and he works on improving his talent by practicing and even more practicing, he says, and by learning how to write more original lyrics. Although his friends and classmates do not understand his fast-paced English, they ask him to sing anyway. They admire him for his own style in music and words. He has also gained a lot of followers on social media. Abdel remains positive and sends out a message of positivity and peace through his rap songs. 
Ninyar Milio, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. I want to go back to when we play this game so things change. That's the way it is. And those are the reasons behind the news, September 18, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. Sitting in for Angelo Castro III, I am Mariela Toza, reporting live from Perth, Australia. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.